Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. Real Estate Coaching Radio is the nation's number one daily radio show for realtors who demand authentic, real-time coaching. Get ready for fluff-free, unfiltered, full-strength honesty about what's truly working to get you into action, helping others, and making money now in today's real estate market. Now to our hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. Well, Julie and I are having an interesting day. So when we're from the Midwest in Columbus, Ohio, and when we were growing up, you didn't get the day off from school unless there was a six feet of snow and there was zombie apocalypse that was on the horizon, and basically everything was covered with 14 feet of ice, and then maybe they'll let you out of school a half day early. Here in Puerto Rico, if they think maybe it's going to have a little bit of rain or a little slight storm, guess what they do? They go off school. <laughs> so... Yeah, we're having an interesting day. It's just so it's so strange to have uh, your kid not go to school when it's 70 degrees out and beautiful, and you know, with a storm that may or may not hit. So, in any event, Julie, welcome to today's podcast. Thank you. Yes, it is most bizarre because yeah, that's just a normal day in the Midwest. What's the big deal? But to uh, the credit of Puerto Rico, I do feel probably they're a bit shell shocked from Maria, and who knows how it's really going to go. So. I think they're just erring on the side of caution. But, yeah, it's mostly a pretty sunny day and pretty nice out. So Yeah, yeah getting, it. Ad, getting adjusted to um, uh, the Puerto Rican, um, this hurricane season, is you, you folks in Florida, I thought I understood, <laughs> but we didn't. Yeah, <laughs> so now we do. I kind of, I understand now and I appreciate it. It's, it's kind of a different experience, you know. In any event, so we're going to be talking to you guys about a, something that you have requested that we present. And this is the topic of today's call is how to sell the impossible to sell a listing. And some of you are going to be saying to yourself, Tim, what the heck, dude? Every time I put something for sale, it sells itself. Well, we're trying to prepare you for what might be a significant turn in the road in the real estate markets over the next 12 months or less, depending on your market. And we want you to be overprepared. So remember this, guys. It's very simple. Just hope for the best and be prepared for the worst. Don't just hope for the best and, and not be prepared for anything else other than the best. Because then what happens if there is a hurricane that hits your doorstep, you're going to be more than prepared with your, um, you know, your arsenal of preparedness, your scripts, your objection handlers, knowing how to work with sellers. We're seeing absolute clear um, – slowdowns in all the major markets, starting on the very, very upper end. The pattern of a, a market adjusting towards a buyer's market is very predictable. It always happens in the same order. You never see a market slowdown happen in the you know, very bottom end of the market. It always starts in the upper end of the market and works its way down, and that's certainly what's happening. We had a really great, and the feedback's been wonderful. Thank you for all of you for sending us the emails and the text interview yesterday with Robert Johnson. Um, Though he won't say it until it's official, I suspect Robert is going to be not only the number one agent in Greenwich, Connecticut, but I think he's also going to be one of the top five agents, um, individual agents in the country. Um, Rob sells, I think he'll close between 130 and 150 million in volume this year, and he does it with him and an assistant, a really wonderful assistant named Lisa, and. Um, that's something I think you guys all need to dial into because you're not realizing that this big team thing and all the other sort of things that you guys have normalized in the real estate markets, you don't realize that those things are just essentially only really happening during a hot seller's market. Because what happens in a hot seller's market is the houses sell themselves. And it's easy to fool yourself into thinking it was you. In other words, you start believing that the house sold because somehow you have some you know, magic secret sauce and your marketing formula and all this other stuff. It's not until you're in a buyer's market that you realize essentially the velocity of the market, it being a strong seller's market, was what was getting listings sold, and you were just fortunate enough to be in the right place to have the listing. I know some of you are going to find that offensive, but don't. I'm not trying to offend you. What I'm trying to do is help you understand that you know, as soon as the market starts to change and buyers start worry about worrying about catching a falling knife and just the whole thing, when you start feeling that, um, I don't want you to be ill prepared because it's coming to a market near you very soon. Starts in the upper end, works its way down. I want you to listen to that interview I did yesterday with Robert Johnson because he has been in a protracted 
buyer's market. Years, guys. New York is experiencing the same thing. We started reporting on the slowdown in New York City two and a half years ago, maybe three years ago. That's when we started seeing it. We're seeing it, though it's not being publicized, out in California. We're seeing it, though it's starting to be publicized in Florida. And you will notice that the markets will do everything that they can, the real estate um, industry will do everything it's can, it possibly can to not report on the negative news. You will find the negative news is something about housing that people do their best to try to refute. And the reason is, is because the industry, and most agents for that matter, do not know how to adapt to a normal market. And a normal market won't be experienced across the country until we go through what will feel like a very, for some of you, a very painful buyer's market, and then we'll return to a normal market. The industry loves a seller's market, and why? Because during a seller's market, things sell faster, they're easier to sell, you don't need a lot of skill. Goofy things like Instagram and you know being a mayor of your video world and making YouTube videos and being unprofitable teams and buying leads, those types of things can only exist during the type of market we've had for the last 10 years. And there's so many people that are addicted to um, you know, agents who are addicted to buying all those widgets and wadgets and easy buttons that they don't know any different. But here's really at the heart of essentially the seduction that's happened to our nation's agents is that many of you who've only been in the business since the, um, you know, since really 2000 and let's say nine or 10, many of you listening, uh, you don't know any better. So you think that all the things out there, the, you know, the mindset, the motivation, the teams, the branding, the direct mail, the expansion teams, all this stuff, you don't know that that stuff only works in a certain kind of market. And that certain kind of market is when there's a lot of velocity to cash flow. What do I mean by that? When you list a house and it sells itself, even if you're running an inefficient business, this cash flow, the speed in which you get paid, makes up for your incompetency, frankly, as an entrepreneur. And it's not until money's tight do you realize where essentially you are wasting the money. And what happens every market cycle, towards the end of every market cycle, people will deny it. People will absolutely, positively do anything and everything except talk about agents dropping net profit. All those types of conversations are the conversations we have routinely on this podcast. Why do we do it? It's, I mean, if you guys think about it, we sell coaching. So why do we do it? If we make agents, you know, agents might not uh, want to buy coaching if they hear what we're saying. So there's no direct reason, an obvious reason why we're doing other than the truth. And the truth is, is because Julie and I have been in this industry for a long time, and we know what happens if, you know, we've seen the actual human fallout of not being prepared for a recession. It's, it's unbelievably painful and tragic and sad. And for Julie and I not to over-prepare all of you guys, even at our own detriment, um, is immoral. That's how we actually think. And hopefully you appreciate that, too. Um, hopefully you do. <laughs> well, I think you do, because this is the nation, nation's number one uh, daily listen to podcast for real estate agents. Anything you want to tag on that, Julie? Well, you know, the analogy last go around was if we knew that there was an oncoming truck and you were standing in the road and we didn't shove you out of the way, you know, that would not be good, would it? So how big is the truck this time around? It's probably not as bad as last time, but that doesn't mean you're not going to feel it. That doesn't mean you don't need to move out of the way. It's still a truck. And we are seeing this, Tim. I mean, I, I was just uh, scanning through my email and, you know, we get copied on all kinds of agent email all over the country. So I'm noticing a lot of price reduction announcements, more than uh, probably we've seen in at least five or six years. And some of these are little tiny weenie price reductions, which tells you, you know, maybe they failed at that conversation on some level. And some of them are really significant price uh, adjustments. So I think that's a leading indicator. I can tell you from doing daily premier coaching calls what's on agents' minds. And that's a combination of things that we talked about in phase two of a changing real estate market about a week or two ago, things like appraisals becoming more of an issue, home inspections be becoming more of a negotiated item versus go jump in a lake, I've got three offers to choose from, um, you know, extended closings. And then we still see one of the clients I just hung up with uh, right before this call you know, she had what, what most agents would call the miracle deal. She listed it three weeks ago, got an all-cash offer, and they were at the closing table today. That still goes on even in a changing market. So you've got to be really tuned in to each individual seller and buyer situation so that you can give them the best advice 
and get them to the finish line. Not every case will be the same, and that actually is an indication that we're in phase two of a changing market, the fact that we have both of those things happening at the same time. That's my yeah, future and, asked. <laughs> no, I, I, we, we, I want to get to our first point here in a second, but you've actually teed me up perfectly. If you guys, those of you who don't want to screw around anymore, those of you who are, you know, look, now's the time. Don't wait, guys, please. Don't wait to get prepared after essentially it's too late. When the zombies are peeking in your window, <laughs> I, I just had the visualization of that. You probably waited too long. So do yourself yeah. a favor. Request a free coaching call, and it's so easy, and it's fun too, actually. So text the word Harris. Julie, what's the code? What's the number? <laughs> 31996. Yep, I was just testing you to see if, if you were paying if attention. If you were a tattooing kind of guy, I'd tattoo it on your forearm just to, you know. Yeah, yeah I was. I do need some tattoos. Don't I? I think I've missed that tattoo window. I think now that yeah. I'm 49, almost 50, to get tattoos at this yeah. point just looks kind of lame. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Unless I don't know, it's maybe. 31996, then it's useful. Yeah, unless it's 31996, exactly. That's some, it's probably some sort of secret code to something. Anyway, so guys, text the word Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, to 31996. Text the word Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, to 31996. And when you do, you're going to be given six free books, including the Real Estate Treasure Map. Um, and you're also going to be entitled to a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. And on that free coaching call, you're going to be having a conversation with them about what, exactly what we're talking about, preparedness, building your lead generation plan, creating your real estate treasure map. This is free. You have no obligation. And this is our attempt to help you get ahead of the curve. Some of you from that coaching call will want to enroll in our, uh, our premier coaching program, which we would be honored to have you as coaching clients. The moral of the story here, guys, is do not wait. You have to take action on this. Don't wait for somebody else to validate what we're saying. They won't. I promise you, you are not going to hear anybody in the real estate industry, not a single soul, saying what we're telling you. They will not, re they will not say anything close to what we're saying because 99% of the brokerages, business models, people selling you guys stuff, all of their business models are predicated on a seller's market. Understand what I'm saying. And their fear is if you guys start realizing that the seller's market is over for many of you, that's definitely true, you're then going to start thinking like responsible business owners. You're going to start thinking about your own personal economy. You're going to stop being seduced by people trying to sell you elegant lies about, you know, easy done for you this and teams for that and expansion teams and branding and all that other crap that you guys get constantly inundated in your email boxes. They know that if you knew that the market was going to change, you would be a hell of a lot more careful on where you put your money. That's what we want you to be. So do the smart thing and text the word Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, to 31996, and do that now, would you? <laughs> do it while lines are open. No, go ahead and text Harris to 31996. I think this hurricane's got my brain a little miswired, Julie. All this lightning we're seeing out the yeah. window. There's a lot of right. electricity in the air. Yeah. There is a lot of electricity. Okay, so here's, here's the topic of today's podcast, and looking at Julie's notes, probably tomorrow's. How to sell the impossible to sell a listing, Miss Julie? Yes, yeah, so keeping in mind, and we, we started a little discussion of this on last week's podcast, so this is still true. There is no magical marketing plan, idea, campaign, or video that will get an overpriced, tough-to-sell listing sold. Remember, that's just advertising. I've got a tough-to-sell, overpriced listing that isn't sold. So stop looking for that miracle. We, we edged into this a little bit by saying you've got to sharpen your skills instead. The first thing I want you to do, this is before you talk to the seller, before you do anything, you've got to revisit the situation yourself. You do a new CMA. Now you know what the house is like. You know some feedback. You've seen some pending sales. It's been around. But what I want you to do is pretend it's a new listing. Where would you price it at today? Considering the following, and, and when you do this on a tough-to-sell existing listing, I guarantee you, you guys are going to drill down probably a little deeper than when you first took it. Market may have shifted on you in that meantime. Consider absorption rate, days on the market, list to sell price ratio, what are the trends, and the number of homes you're competing against. I, sh I need to add another bullet point to that, Tim, is consider if there's new construction that you're competing against. That may not be obvious. It may or may not be in your MLS, but if you're competing against new construction, that could be the number one reason you're not selling. So you've got to know what is the skinny with this subject property. 
and we did a little bit of that last week, so I'm going to go on to point number two. Review the seller's motivation. Why are they moving? Some of you guys have a lot of inventory right now. The client I just hung up with, she's got more than 50 listings in inventory. But she can tell me of each of her sellers, because we work on this. If I say, okay, listing number 13, why are they moving? She can tell me. Are they a have-to-move seller or just a want-to-move seller? Where are they going to move when it sells? Okay, another coaching client yesterday, she's got one of these, hard to sell. But the seller's motivation is, well, we're going to try and get our price. If we can't, we're going to keep it as our hideaway in Chicago. Okay, so they don't have to sell. They just want to sell. And that is directly related to the current pricing. We're going to find out this week how serious they are about having a hideout in Chicago, which is going to be more expensive, maintaining that property when they only use it two or three times a year, or ripping the Band-Aid off and giving it a good price that will cause it to actually sell. So you've got to know their motivation. Not every situation is the same. Have they already moved? Remember, their motivation may have changed since you first listed the home. Now, note to self, and this is something we really drilled down on, on uh, Premier Coaching the other day. If your seller is also buying with you and they don't have a good feel for where they're moving, that might be the issue. Why would they give you a better price if they don't know where they're going to move? Okay, now some of you guys don't show them anything. You're not pre-qualifying them. You're not following up on their financing if they're getting financing. And you're not really drilling down on where they'd move. Okay, so here's the solution. Take them out. This does not mean show them 40 properties, but you do need to take them out for a long afternoon, possibly even a full day to actually see what their options are. They need to fall in love with what's next so they can let go of what's current. Does that make sense, Tim? We used to use new construction for that all the time, which is actually Definitely. the next point. Yeah. Yeah. Keep rolling, lady. So, all right. So sometimes new construction is the answer. Be sure you know what's being built where and at what price points. Learn the builder incentives. This may require you to go out for a day and investigate the options before you take your client out. You, listeners, could be the problem. You might actually be the reason that your hard-to-sell listing is not selling because you haven't gotten these people to fall in love with what's next so they can get let go of what was last. This is such a, a major point. It works so well, particularly with new construction, but it certainly can work with a resale that they love as well. Related to that, I do see some home sale contingencies getting accepted. Not a ton, but it's coming back into the marketplace. Another indicator that your market is shifting away from seller control back towards the buyers. Now, again, this whole section is in reviewing what is the situation. Point number three is keeping the home an option for your seller. Might they lease it? Always say yes to leasing it. You may also advertise it for lease and sale at the same time, and the seller can decide what to do based on which happens first. Some let, of you guys me, immediately try and talk them out of it. Go ahead. Let me throw something in there. So what you guys are going to run into, Julie, what she was, her point was, is that you will run it, especially in the upper end. You'll have people say, well, if it doesn't sell, we'll just lease it. And they can. Uh, again, listen to the Robert Johnson interview yesterday. He comes up with uh, buyer, buyers all the time. Well, they'll lease for twelve, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month, right? I know in many markets that seems crazy, but there you go. And so, what you've got to do is when you go in to talk with sellers because they know that rental market exists, you're going to have to be able to offer them alternatives to just putting the house for sale. So they'll say, "If I don't get my price, I'll lease it." You must say, "Well, that's great. I handle leasing as well." So. We can use leasing as our plan B. If you don't say that, you won't get the listing because of the fact that you just presented yourself as a resale list an agent. Oh, I don't do leases. Well, guess what? You just kissed that listing goodbye. But here's another alternative. Yep. The, other, the flip side, you could then start prospecting. <gasps> prospecting, Tim. Holy crap. Oh, no. Does that mean actually doing proactive lead? What? Yes, prospecting actual for rents. So you can start calling for rents, and I'll tell you what some people are doing is they're calling VRBOs. They're calling those types of people and asking them if they want to sell their houses, and you'll be shocked how many people are saying yes. On the upper end, if you start prospecting uh, property managers that are handling those properties, not all of them have real, well, they have real estate licenses, but they don't necessarily do resale. That would be a good relationship for you to form. Maybe you don't want to do the property management yourself, but what you could do is work out a collaborative arrangement with a property manager or managers where when you have a 
seller that absolutely positively uh, wants to lease and you can't get the property sold, which is going to happen, you could flip it to that property manager with the agreement that there's no way that, I mean, once that seller decides to sell, that their the property manager will definitely make sure that listing comes back your way. There's all kinds of interesting relationships that you can start forming in a changing market, but you've got to get ahead of the curve and think outside of the box. The key here is you never say no. When you go to talk to a seller, if your only tool in your toolbox is your ability to list a house, you are going to have essentially a harder time getting business than an agent who has multiple ways of solving the problem. That also extends to knowing how to do short sales, to do leases, to do you know, owner financing in some cases. These are all the things we teach you in Premier Coaching. If you've not yet done so, text the word Harris to 31996. Text the word Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, to 31996. Julie? Yes, you just read my mind about saying yes to, yeah, I know, we're saying those words again, short sale. But uh, here's another thing, Tim, that came out in Premier Coaching. Keeping in mind that there is a generation of agents out there who have only heard tell of short sales, REOs, foreclosures, BPOs, all of these scary words. Okay, so here's the thing, guys. Just because the seller might take less than they paid or might be maybe not recouping all of their down payment, maybe they just refinanced, That by itself does not equal a short sale. I know it's shocking, but true. Just because they're selling it for less does not equal a short sale. There are many, many, many instances. I know it's it's crazy, Tim, that they do not buy this, some of our listeners. But our grizzled veterans know it's true. So many examples of where a seller will actually write a check at the table, write a check from their 401k, write a check from their savings account to get rid of the house. Sometimes that's like, you know, $4,000. Other times, listen to Rob's interview yesterday, it might be 100000 It might even be more. Just because they are, quote, losing money does not equal a short sale. I think a lot of the agents today go into panic mode. Oh, my God, I don't know how to do a short sale. When they figure out what the numbers are, and, and it's like they're skipping way ahead to the facts. Maybe the seller's motivated enough that they just want it sold. They just want to rip that Band-Aid off. And they'll actually, oh, my gosh, they will actually break even. They'll do it. They'll actually get to the closing table. Now, this only happens when they're really motivated. So keep that in mind. Don't try and have that conversation if they don't actually have to sell it. Go ahead. But what Julie's telling you, and hopefully you guys are understanding why she went down that road, is if you don't have multiple ways of solving somebody's problem in a changing market, you're going to be out of business. That's the whole point Mm -hmm. of what we're trying to get you to understand. You have got to stop doing the silly easy button stuff that so many of you are addicted to and start focusing on with the skill set because the skill set's what wins in a marketplace like this. And having a skill set is also, you know, knowing things that other people don't know gives you an unfair advantage in the marketplace every single time. And if you walk into a listing, if you're competing for a listing, which, yes, I know none, many of you never have, but you will, in a market like this, centers of influence and past clients are going to make you compete. They're not just going to list with you because they like you because they're not going to be confident that you're going to be able to sell the house. And so you're going to have to start competing with agents. And if you only know how to do one or two things, if you don't know multiple ways to solve people's problems, you will be out of business. That is the nature of this market we're moving into, guys. Listen to what your coaches or we might be your future coaches are telling you. Next point, Mm -hmm. Julie. Yes, indeed. So here's the secret. Once you actually discuss the reality of them being a landlord, okay, so with regards of I'll just keep it as a rental, the amount it will probably lease for, so you have to be able to figure that out, and what their net will be, they may change their mind about leasing it. So know how to research lease pricing if you haven't already. That could be a possibility. That might be a short 30-minute exercise in math where they go, oh, well, if I'm going to lose 500 bucks a month, maybe that doesn't make sense. Or maybe they say, yep, we'll, we'll just you know, keep it and we'll see what happens next year. So now we're on to strategies for, again, getting rid of the hard-to-sell house. Set up what we call, this is not a script for you to use with your sellers, set up what is called the seller's reality tour for yourself <laughs> and your client. Okay. So don't call it that. That might cause panic. Do your research first so you know what you're going to show and how it impacts the subject property. Then actually take your sellers out on a showing trip where you'll see what they're competing against as well as what's currently pending. Don't overcoach them. Show the properties and ask what their thoughts are. Okay? They need to see what you see. Otherwise, it could be construed as, gosh, every time you call me, all you want is to beat me down in price. The seller's reality tour actually shows them as if they are a buyer. What's happening in the eyes of the buyer? Let's take our seller's hat off and let's go see 
We're going to see pendings. That's what's actually selling. Let's see why those sold over the competition, and let's see what we're now up against. That usually does the trick, but again, know what you're signing yourself up for by doing your research first. Okay, point number five. Again, this is strategy. Discuss with your seller that, quote, taking it off and trying again next quarter, next year, next season is not always the best plan. When do they have the most competition? Usually it's in the spring. Many, many tough to sell listings will sell fourth quarter or first quarter when there's less competition. Relocating executives usually move during these quarters. So this is particularly good for the higher end stuff. But yes, you will have fewer showings. And as we get into fourth quarter, we're going to be doing uh, some discussion about holiday objection handling and all of that usual fourth quarter stuff with you guys. But make sure that they know what it would mean to, quote, put it back on the market in the spring. Interest rates might be higher. They're definitely going to have more competition, and everybody else is going to wait till spring. So usually when there's more to compete with, what happens to the price? Does it go up or does it go down? Usually it goes down. So make sure you've had that conversation. Now, conversely, if there's a real good reason they want to try again in the spring, maybe their new construction house isn't going to be built until about that time, then maybe that is the best choice for them, but you've got to have those conversations. Okay. Here's one that scares them. Number six, just ask if their plan is to simply relist it with someone new. I know it's scary, but you've got to ask. What's the first thing the new agent's going to ask them to do? They're going to ask for a new price. So why would you lose valuable marketing time with restaging new photos, new videos, and new media when you can adjust the price for them now and save them all of that time, not to mention two or three more house payments? Make sense? Well, Julie, level up. It's a scary level thing. Level off. Well, but so why? What, what's the heart of basically what you and I are talking about exhaustively here is the fact that they don't know how to get price reductions, the fact that they don't know right. how to have conversations because they're hoping and praying that somehow miraculously the house sells because they've never had yeah. to develop the skill set on how to get price changes. That's the truth. Many of you have no clue how to reposition a house in the market so that it correctly reflects the market's expectations. I just gave you a nice little script where you're paying attention. Mm-hmm. You are going to lose listings. You're going to, some of you are going to be coming out of the seller's market thinking you're badasses, and then you're going to realize as soon as things stop, you don't know how to – how do you explain to a buyer why they want to buy? How do you explain to a buyer why they want to purchase a house when they can lease a house and over, say, five years – actually have less invested in the house than if they were to purchase it. In other words, the buyer knows they're going to lose money. How do you sell a house to a buyer that knows they're going to lose money? Yeah. That's a crazy thought, isn't it? You should listen to the interview I did with Rob Johnson. We talked about that very thing yesterday. How are you going to convince a seller through using facts that they need to reposition the house in the market, lower the price now, not in the spring, and because statistically if they wait, they're going to lose that much more? Julie just touched on that. She talked about the added cost of carrying the property. So unless you know how to have these types of conversations, you're going to struggle needlessly. And you're going to see that new agents in your marketplace are the ones that start dominating. You're going to see that agents who definitely have probably always had the skill set but just haven't had an opportunity to use it. You know, it's interesting. There are some agents that only do good in a seller's market, and there's some agents that only do good in a transitioning or a buyer's market. But what you do almost always see is who was dominant in the seller's market is not dominant in a buyer's market. It's a very rare agent that can pivot their approach uh, to adjust to a marketplace. And they rationalize. They'll, they'll, They'll make excuses for their failure, but at the end of the day, it's just they didn't take the time to learn the new skill set that's necessary in a new market. Is all this making sense to you guys? Are you hearing what we're saying to you? This is not, I'll do it in the spring or I'll do it next year. This is urgent. The things we're asking you to do now are urgent. Take it seriously. Text the word Harris to 31996. Again, when you do that, you're going to be given six free books, and you're also going to be entitled to a free coaching call with one of our new member coaches. So we're going to pick up tomorrow, assuming the hurricane passes us by, (laughs) where we left (laughs) off today. Ideally. Um, If you guys need to get a hold of me or Julie, as always, you can text me. Text me at 512-758-0206, I'm sorry, 512-758-0206. 512-758-0206. In the meantime, you guys have a fantastic day. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. This program has been a presentation by Tim and Julie Harris, Real Estate Coaching. For more information on our real estate coaching and training programs, 
visit our website at timandjulieharris.com. Remember to tune in weekdays at noon for upcoming shows. And until next time, thank you for listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris. Thank you.